Welcome to this exciting episode of our Med AI workshop series. Today, we are exploring the transformative impact of artificial intelligence in neonatal intensive care unit, a topic that promises to redefine neonatal care and improve outcomes for our tiniest patients. We are thrilled to have with us distinguished experts who are at the forefront of this revolutionary field. Firstly, I would like to introduce Dr. Bryn Selvain, an associate a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Neonatology at the University of Virginia. Dr. Brin's remarkable work bridges the realms of clinical and computational research focusing on AI-powered predictive analytics to enhance neonatal care. Her research includes developing early warning sy symptoms uh, for infection in preterm infants and uh, using pulse oximetry data to assess neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. Dr. Brin's contribution are pivotal in ad advancing the use of AI to predict and prevent critical conditions in newborns, thereby significantly improving the quality of neonatal care. Next, we have Dr. Deepu Patel, a digital health consultant renowned for her blend of clinical expertise and tech-driven patient empowerment. Our esteemed speakers bring wealth of knowledge and expertise to the table, and we are privileged to have them here to explore fascinating intersection of AI and neonatal care. Let's start our conversation and dive into this important topic. So Dr. Deepu, I would like to hand it over to you from here. Thank you, Hithvi, and welcome, Bryn Sullivan, to our Decoding AI in Healthcare podcast. We're so honored to have you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Um, this is a very interesting topic for me uh, in terms of the, the quality and the level of care that is provided to our tiniest little ones uh, who enter this world um, in many various fashions, I guess, and you are there to take care of them. But before we dive into how AI is impacting NICU care overall, uh, tell me what got you interested into in AI and predictive analytics. I understand you've been doing this even before AI became a hot topic. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. And um, I'll just start um, by sort of outline the background of my research and sort of what got me into this. Um, it started with the work of my mentors, actually. Um, Randall Mormon and Doug Lake at the University of Virginia, along with neonatologist Ken Griffin, uh, in the early 2000s, um, recognized that preterm infants had reduced heart rate variability and heart rate decelerations near sepsis diagnosis. Um, sepsis in the NICU uh, is uh, something that we, we face often and, and worry about even more often. And so um, they noticed this pattern and, and uh, recognized it as also a sign of fetal distress in mm -hmm. obstetric fetal heart rate monitoring with reduced heart rate variability and decelerations. Mm -hmm. um, those are classic signs of fetal distress that indicate um, emergent delivery. And these preterm babies are meant to be still in the womb. And so it, it wasn't surprising that we were seeing these the same patterns in, um, in the NICU. And so they wired uh, ways to collect the electrocardiogram heart rate records and uh, reviewed hundreds of, of records of heart rates and uh, sepsis events and developed the mathematical algorithms needed to capture the visual pattern that they were seeing. And so these included heart rate standard deviation to measure variability, um, but with the decelerations, um, you know, they weren't just seeing a reduced heart rate variability, the decelerations actually increased the variability. So they also developed a ratio to capture the asymmetry of heart rate accelerations to decelerations as well as a metric called sample entropy. And that is a measure that's good at detecting a spike on a flat line um, in a time series. And so these features went into um, a logistic regression model and mm -hmm. they developed or trained the model to predict late onset sepsis diagnosis in the next 24 hours. Um, they externally validated the model and then conducted uh, 
still to date the largest randomized trial in preterm infants with 3,000 infants enrolled from nine centers. And they were randomized to have the hero displayed at the bedside or not displayed. And the results showed that infants randomized to have the, the hero system displayed had a 20% mortality reduction. And among infants with sepsis, uh, the mortality reduction was even greater, um, as, as high as 40%. Um, and so I joined the group after this trial had been conducted and the system was in use in our NICU. I was a pediatric resident and um, my work began with the clinical question that um, when I was using the HERO system, you know, sepsis, confirmed sepsis is, is rare, uh, fortunately, um, but there are numerous sepsis-like illnesses. And so what other diagnoses or sepsis cause a sepsis-like syndrome in the NICU that mm -hmm. the HERO algorithm was detecting. And so I you know, did some chart review, uh, learned the methods, and we found that when it wasn't culture-positive sepsis, it was usually another infection, um, uh, such as necrotizing colitis, urinary tract infection, pneumonia. Um, but about a third of the time, there was a major respiratory deterioration without infection. And so around this time, the group was also developing algorithms to detect apnea and respiratory patterns. And so my work sort of came out of the idea that um, we can detect these patterns that we previously couldn't see in the heart rate. Um, and we know that respiratory deterioration happens often with the sepsis-like syndrome. Um, so there's more information in the data at hand, um, and specifically the respiratory monitoring data. Um, and so I uh, joined the group and uh, set out to develop a cardiorespiratory predictive system. Okay, that's that's pretty intense. So the heart rate, the hero system that you alluded to, was uh, already existing during your training. Uh, okay. And HERO stands for heart rate observation uh, for our audience. Um, and then you built upon the HERO system to add the respiratory component. Of it. And and um, and so what are some of the, I guess, the key milestones um, with the combination of the, of the addition of the respiratory aspect to the HERO system? Have you seen sure. any? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the, the patterns that uh, we found in the respiratory data, um, specifically from pulse oximetry monitoring, uh, oxygen mm -hmm. saturation, um, is that a, a measure of the cross correlation of heart rate and SpO2 is a pretty good surrogate for apnea detection. And apnea prematurity is very common, um, but increases around the time of infection. Um, that's because of cytokines and um, prostaglandins. Uh, mm -hmm. affect the immature brain stem and lead to increased apnea. And so uh, uh, incorporating the cross correlation of heart rate and SP2 into a predictive monitoring algorithm um, helped detect that increase near um, infection diagnosis. Um, and then another key milestone um, was just uh, really building a multi-center collaboration and a huge database of uh, continuous vital sign records um, and sepsis events. Uh, you know, we really wanted to make sure that um, the model would work at sites with different uh, practice patterns and, um, and uh, you know, the, the HERO system was externally validated in one center and um, we started with a, a two-center collaboration, but have built it to now include four centers. And, um, and so we uh, developed this uh, heart rate and SpO2 model um, on data at our center and then externally validated it in two additional centers. Um, and uh, right now we're um, you know, in the process of, of working through implement, implementation and um, all the complexities that that entails. Uh. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm laughing and smiling because yes, exactly. Implementation itself is another beast of its own. Right. Um, well, let's back up a little bit and um, pretend uh, I'm a pediatric resident 
why is neonatal sepsis such a critical issue in healthcare and what what uh, why how i guess is predictive monitoring uh or i guess how much of a difference does it make in terms of uh, outcomes for preterm infants so i'm i'm your resident and okay. <laughs> teach me the basics of why this is so important sure well so I'll start out with just saying the NICU is a really unique place. In every other ICU, yeah. patients are there because they are sick and they need intensive care. In the NICU, we have this population of preterm infants that are born generally healthy, um, but premature. And so they need support um, and intensive care until they can grow and develop and breathe, eat, maintain their temperature on their own. And so really our job as neonatologists is to keep them as healthy as possible, support their immature organs and give them the nutrition they need to grow, which mm -hmm. sounds easy enough, but <laughs> it's all more the, complex. Yeah. <laughs> with their, you know, uh, impaired immune systems and all of the plastic lines and tubes that need to go in to support them. Those are infection risk factors. And mm -hmm. um, so they, they're have high risk of their, you know, there's the support not being ideal and um, as far as the respiratory um, decompensation goes and then um, with infection, um, at any moment, um, they can go from healthy to sick. And it's, it's a unique aspect of the NICU where we have full continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring and have the opportunity over a course of time to watch um, patterns transition from healthy to sick. Um, mm -hmm. And it's in, in those data that the earliest signs of infection present. The autonomic nervous system regulates heart rate and breathing and also responds to um, infection. Cytokines, immune cells uh, trigger the autonomic nervous system to respond with sympathetic activation and the parasympathetic anti-inflammatory response. And, um, and it's in this change in the balance of homeostasis that we see the earliest signs of infection. And so that makes it truly useful as a warning system, not so much a diagnostic. It's still, you know, the everything that the vital sign patterns need to be put in context with everything else. Um, yeah. And um, given how rare the sepsis is and, and there are multiple overlapping conditions, you know, there, there will be false positives, but yeah. um, the value is in the early warning of um, a change from baseline. Let's pick up on that in terms of the false positives, because we, we know that this is not a perfect science. Medicine never has been. There's always that balance of science and art. And right. uh, as predictive analytics have the promise of making, at least allowing us and informing our decisions a little bit better as clinicians, um, there are challenges. It doesn't get it right all the time. And so in terms of the challenges encountered in either building these algorithms or assessing these algorithms as you're validating them, what are some right. of the challenges you, you have encountered? I think, you know, the, the aspect of false positives has been a, a huge challenge just in the, the clinical adoption and understanding of the, the system. You know, we, we think of these tools as diagnostic, you know, the, a lab value that is obtained at a point in time and, um, you know, has a threshold of normal and abnormal. But with these um, continuous risk prediction scores, it's it's more of a trend and not so much a point in time. And, and that trend is hard to capture in um, traditional metrics of sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value. Um, the calibration of the model gives you a sense of performance uh, at, at the full range of risk scores. And so um, we've found that um, both our new model and the HERO score is very well calibrated um, and across, you know, 
the the decades that we've been using it. So human mm-hmm. physiology hasn't changed, and it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, we don't need but, one more variable, right? <laughs> um, you know, among the low risk scores, there is a very low rate of observed sepsis. Among the high risk scores, there is a, a, a matching high rate of sepsis. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that rate is still quite low, but um, the, the fold increase in sepsis um, matches the predicted risk. Um, you know, Go ahead. Sorry, go no, go ahead, go ahead. Finish your thought. Uh, so just you know, going back to false positive, I think you know, it in my experience of using it in, in our NICU and having um you know people come in and out and learners, um it, the key is to to have continued education and understanding of its utility as a as an early warning marker to go look at the patient, you go do an assessment, a physical exam, put it in context, um, and don't automatically draw a blood culture. Yeah, and I, I think what you're saying is that use it for the tool that it was intended to be, not the diagnosing of. Right. Um, yeah, and I think that you make an excellent point. I think the um, the question that I was going to ask, it's you you bring up an interesting point in as we learn medicine, right. is um, you know, oftentimes I will tell students when we're teaching lab studies and interpretation of uh, diagnostic studies, um, especially when it comes to lab values like blood values, um, a single blood value does not a diagnosis make, right? You always have to look at the trend and put it in the context of what the patient, the history and the physical exam that you are uh, obtaining, right. right? Your your eyes and your hands actually add a lot of value to your diagnosis making or your differential diagnosis making. Um, But what's interesting here is that like you mentioned the parameters, like if I look at a sodium or a glucose level, these are the parameters that that the lab has put forth for me. Even though I'm not making a diagnosis on a single value, what you are saying now is we're gonna be looking at it from a very different uh, data point, um, point of view um, I'm using point a lot, but um, because now we're going to have continuous monitoring of data, and we're now looking for those trends. Sometimes the trend won't be apparent for another 24 to 48 hours. Um, and so rather than looking at a single heart rate or respiratory rate or SpO2, you're looking at the trend line because it's a cont- you have the available data to make a better informed decision. And that's, I think, what the power of predictive analytics does for us, especially in this setting. Um, yes. Am I capturing that correctly? Yes, exactly. It's the combination of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. It, it gives us more information. It, it makes our job more efficient. It brings the right person to the right bedside at the right time. Yes, and, and that is absolutely key because it's not about getting, I mean, it is about get, making the right diagnosis, but it is about making sure that you're thinking about that diagnosis based on these trend values that you're seeing or the trends that you're seeing in, in the data. Um, and, and I want to drive that point home, especially for our audience who um, you know, may or may not understand the deeper aspects of algorithm building. Um, and um, one of the things that we always talk about in, um, um, in every uh Every, every time we talk about AI is about the biases and the ethical concerns. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, but in terms of developing now this combination of cardiorespiratory hero system, um, right. what are the, you said you're deploying it, it's been validated. You're deploying it at a number of institutions. Um, what are you seeing in terms of early data coming back to you? And, and, and in terms of when you have validated it, are you having to tweak the algorithm from institution to institution, depending on geographic location, or like what so, are the things that you're doing behind the scenes? To yeah, me? so there are a lot yeah. behind the scenes. We we are noticing that you know the the raw data are slightly different from institution to institution, right. somewhat dependent on the monitors in use. Um, we've got all different, huh. you know types and versions and brands of monitors that were <laughs> in our collaborating centers. And even our own center changed or upgraded our monitors and it changed the heart rate patterns 
ever so slightly. Which then changes the parameter, the normal parameters, right? Exactly. But we find that, you know, there's there's so much data going into this model and algorithm, and it's it's so good at picking up abnormal that, you know, it doesn't change the AUC or calibration tremendously, you know, in a, in a clinically noticeable way. Um, and it's really hard to say if it would be noticed clinically that that minor change in um, performance um, would, if we're not using a threshold per se to automatically draw blood culture, would these these small variations even um, uh, be noticed in clinical decision? Um, and really, to uh, the only way to understand that is to do large randomized control trial um, right. in the <laughs> in the hero trial. Very hard to do in this setting, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> All right. In the in the hero trial, they you know they did look at site differences, and there there were minor differences in you know the the overall hero score and whether it was the monitors or the patient population. Um, the the performance was uh, still equal among the the nine centers. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, so the the end result was. Um, was not changed. Um, but it's something, you know, I think when it's implemented um, to look at your local data and, and understand um, how it works, you know, based on your monitor and population and, and everything. And yeah. Uh, can I ask a clarifying point about the nine centers? Are they all US based? Were they global? Yes, they were all US based. US based. Okay. Um, just say Remember, but sorry, say that again. There might have been one in Canada. I don't remember, but one in Canada. Okay, all right. Um, no, and I asked that because I think part of it, some of it is also resource driven, right? Right. Having the ability, I mean, not all hospitals have NICUs, and not all right. hospitals have, you know, and so it's important to kind of know that if you are interested in this aspect, there are certain resources that you're going to need. Um, right. I'm going to ask um, a question about so another question about behind the scenes. So mm -hmm. you are the person, the clinician using these tools at the bedside, taking right. care of the patients. Um, you're not the one building the algorithm. So right. who are the people behind the scenes? And yeah. one of the thing, one of the the things that I I have said is that our clinical teams of the future are going to be very different than what we traditionally think of clinical teams, yes. which is nurses and PAs and nurse practitioners and doctors and case managers, those are the you know, forward-facing, patient-facing teams. But we also now are going to have data scientists and engineers. Right. So who is on your team and building yes, all of these? Definitely. Of these? Well, that was, you know, when I joined this group, I was very intimidated. I thought I was just going to do my little chart review project and not understand the math talk they were speaking. Um, <laughs> but then one of the engineers said something about babies that just wasn't true at all. And, you know, I spoke up and said, actually, you know, this is, re this is relevant, not that, and this would be clinically meaningful. And I thought, oh, I, I, I am relevant in this group. <laughs> and, um, you know, continue, I was interested by the work. So I continued to work with the group and, and then sort of made a more dedicated effort to understand the data science and mathematician speak and understand the the choices behind the modeling and the methods and um, do just enough coding to be dangerous but not <laughs> build the whole model <laughs> um, and so that's sort of where I've um, you know built built my role in this team and we've got several data scientists um, a data scientist who was a bedside nurse and um, so understands sort of clinical sort of and data science um, aspects um, Doug Lake is our mathematician statistician um, yeah has been with the group for a very long time and um, just continues to uh, have a lot of insight in um, in the data and uh, engineers. Um, I, we've worked with an engineer for a long time who um, really dug into the um, control of breathing, the uh, the physics of breathing, and uh, to develop an apnea algorithm. Um, 
and um, you know we've got a, a school of data scientists of data science here at UVA, so uh, partnering with with students and um, graduates of that program. Um, so it's it's a, a team effort for sure, and um, I think as as a clinician in this uh, research space and you know clinicians of the future, being able to to understand the the methods and and the parameters and why the data science the scientists choose those parameters um, is really valuable um, to be able to bridge bridge the modeling effort to bring it to the bedside. Absolutely, and I and you know, and I think you, I think you have described what I think is a lot a very typical aha moment for clinicians who. I, and I'm one of them where it's, I don't know the math. I don't know the, you know, I don't know how to build computer. I don't know computer science. I don't, I am not even, I don't even know enough coding to be dangerous. So like that's, you know, but, but uh, having an understanding and understanding of where they're coming from right. and knowing that you as a clinician can provide value to them, right? right. That teamwork and collaboration around knowing that, yes, this is important for a baby. It's, you can't just dismiss this particular factor because X, Y, Z. And right. there's a cross education that happens across um, industry and across professions that then leverage, that can be then leveraged to improve patient outcomes. One right. of the things that I often hear from my, um, my engineering friends um, or data scientists is that as healthcare providers, we are awful at data keeping. Um, you know, our data is a mess, which is true. I mean, our, our like medical data is such a, there is no one size fits all. And so there's no way to kind of capture, but there, there, there will be eventually if we get enough clinicians interested in this kind of to your, to your point, I bet, I bet if I were to bet, yes, you changed the way you documented a little bit to say, okay, we're going to need this data down the line for X, Y, Z, right? Right. right. For sure. Um, so we can be better clinicians and then better inform our colleagues to build better algorithms for us for sure. down. Yes. yes. So, um, well, so as we're moving on into, and you had touched on this around false positivity, but are there other things that you are seeing and whether a particular to Hero or other systems that you've, uh, you've kind of seen around reliability and trustworthiness? Um, do you find that the use case for um for ai systems is uh, like in terms of adoption and use cases with um, within NICU i mean you obviously use it but do you find that acceptance across the board with your colleagues um definitely not across the board i think some yeah. so, those who sort of grasp its its utility and can sort of be okay with the false positives, find more utility in it than than those who are more black and white. And um, you know, I think this is uh, going to be a problem across the board in healthcare adopting AI models because what what we want to predict is the rare events, um, right. but that those are the important ones. But um, predicting a rare event is going to result in false positives and. Um, they're going to be encountered um, if, you know, when they're encountered more often than the event, um, it, it's hard for individual users who, um, you know, aren't seeing the evaluation behind the scenes or, um, you know, seeing every event and the, and the, the events that are uh, caught. Um, I think it's easy to lose, lose trust. And also I've noticed, um, you know, with, if, if, you know, a lot of it is evaluate the baby, watch and wait closely, um, if you see the hero score go up, um, and uh, some will sort of write their own anecdote as to why the, the risk score is increased. Um, you know, oh, the, the baby's temperature is a little hot because of the incubator, and maybe that's affecting the heart rate. But, you know, that's something that we, you know, in the isn't actually a physiological reason for the, the heart rate variability to be abnormal, um, it, you know, in the, to, to make the score go up. So um, I think it, it just takes constant education, champions at the bedside and um, 
uh, sort of, you know, reiterating its utility as a as an early warning marker, um, and and sort of as a whole in medicine, figuring out how to um, how to deal with false positives and and understand them. And, mm -hmm. um, so we have actually a couple of questions from our audience. So before I move on to my next question, I'll take one from the audience here. Um, and one question is, what are the primary benefits of implementing AI in, um, in NICUs? Is it to make sure that you're not missing any congenital deformities and also to study phenotypes or to make sure that you're not missing a familial disorder? Um, um, we have you answer them. Yeah. yeah, the congenital anomalies are, are usually picked up by physical exam and, and gene testing and, mm -hmm. um, and imaging and things like that. Um, uh, we've focused our um, predictive analytics in the preterm population because it's a, a very unique population, one where, you know, a deterioration completely derails healthy growth and development. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you walk into a NICU, um, the preterm infants are all in their little incubators covered with a blanket. And, you know, we, we try to make things as womb-like as possible, dark and quiet and not disturb them, um, but every three to four hours. And in those three to four hours, a lot can change. And to, you know, have a system that says, hey, look at this one early, um, right. it can be quite useful. The congenital like anomalies, hours. Yeah. right, exactly. The the babies, the term babies with anomalies, um, to develop something specific to individual conditions, they're all quite rare, you know, in the grand scheme of things, um, especially, you know, congenital cardiac anomalies um, would take many centers, large databases, a lot of data to really, to get enough to be specific to those conditions. So. That's why we we focused on preterm infants because there's yeah. we we recognize the utility and the continuous risk prediction there. But I'm I'm sure the the term babies with anomalies there's there's other uses for data to to predict specific outcomes there. But I think in general in NICU and and probably in many other populations a one size fits all model is not. Um, Sounds good, but it's not. Um, I know. And, you know, it's funny all. because we have operated in medicine with a one size fits all model for so long that right. this truly is a shift in how we practice and kind of right. learning it as we're going and bridging the one size fits all to a, you know, personalized, personalized <laughs> model using analytics all at the same time. It, it's going to take a while for us to transition. For um, sure from from the the what now I guess we would call traditional medicine. Uh, so you had mentioned that the the um a lot of the babies that you see in preterm the preterm infants are in um you know a, a separate area kind of uh in a dark room and whatever. It, so uh, the que the question I had was around these systems can be fairly expensive, not only to build but then to maintain and right. uh continually manage and update. Um in terms of um, investment in predictive monitoring systems at healthcare facilities, um, the, the cost can be really heavy. Uh, what have you kind of seen in terms of support, whether it be financial or human resources or training, education, and then what are the long-term benefits that you've seen? Because you've trained at this place and now right. you practice at the same place. So you've right. seen kind of both sides of it. Can right. you speak to that journey a little bit and the resources? Yeah. I think as far as, you know, the the cost of it, you know, in, in building models, especially ones that use data that aren't readily available, it, it requires commercial, a commercial partner, commercialization, okay. or a, a third party software to connect. Um, I think, you know, to, to make it widely available, um, each institution has their own, you know, technology infrastructure and data infrastructure. So to 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 require each institution or, or NICU to build their own way to harness the data would not be feasible to make it widespread. So the the team that developed the Hero um, system 
uh, uh, commercialized it. Um, so the, I guess, generic term for the model is the heart rate characteristics index, and then they commercialized it as the hero score um, with a, a company that is still local here in Virginia. And, um, and that allowed um, the, the monitoring system to be available to other NICUs. Um, uh, since then, we've, you know, because we've been at this for so long, we've built our own systems for harnessing data and, and mm -hmm. displaying. Um, but that takes a lot of time and um, uh, personnel um, support. And uh, for that, uh, grant funding and, um, you know, continuous steady funding is key. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as far as the, the cost to institutions and, and how it may benefit, um, uh, again, just using the HERO system as an example, um, they did a, a cost analysis, but it's, it's tricky. Anything that reduces mortality, um, uh, if a baby dies, their, you know, their costs go away. Um, but how do you value the value that cost yeah. of a life lost? Um, and so uh, it did show a reduction in um, uh, the, the percent of babies um, with a length of stay beyond 120 days in the display mm -hmm. group. Um, and then um, uh, there were trends towards uh, reduced length of stay in the display group, but that was with counting those who died as staying for 120 days. So not a, a there's no sort of perfect way to um, right. evaluate um, uh, length of stay and the, and the cost of mortality. Um, yeah. And I, I think for, especially for health systems who are um, struggling with high mortality or high sepsis severity, um, um, that might be, uh, where where value can be added and you know also in learning health systems with a lot of learners um a lot of turnover um again i think artificial intelligence can can make our work more efficient and in the case of a, a predictive monitoring system get get the right people to the right that side um yeah. and For sure. Um, I think each, each health system has to, um, has to weigh the cost of, of, you know, pur purchasing technology with, with what outcomes they want to improve. Yeah. I mean, again, I think, you know, it's the, one of the things that when I, when I, when I speak with healthcare administrators about investing in, um, a, a new tool or a new system, um, it is an investment. It is not a cost. Um, and you have to kind of have the end goal in mind, right? If your goal is to reduce mortality rates, then that's that's the investment that you're making. Um, right. Because at the end of the day, it may not be the 120-day right. metric. But it may be a five-year outcome that you're looking right. at. Um, so really starting with the end in mind um, really leads to, a, I think, a better investment model and reframing the we're spending money versus to versus we're investing money or human capital or whatever version that may be in terms of training because right. at the end of the day i think ai and the tools that will ultimately come out from this particular technology to benefit healthcare we're still on a in the very early stages of it even 20 years in i would say that it's we're still early because it hasn't had full scale adoption yet because right. we're still learning and right. there's still going to be an evolution while, while the physiology doesn't change the evolution yes. of the data set and yes. the the personal the patient the the preterm baby changes from um you know whether it be geographic location or what, whatever it may be there are a lot of variables there and so um i would right. say we're still in the learning phase we're not quite at the leveraging phase full scale is right. how I would kind of yeah and that's something that I've I've learned through all of this is you know I got into it on the the modeling side and developing um predictive models but now facing the implementation 
side yeah. feels like uh, a much bigger challenge. And and yes. even after ad- implementing it, getting people to adopt it and ensuring that it's accurate and unbiased and um, holds up over time. Um, Absolutely. It, it yeah. makes the, the model development part of it seem easy. <laughs> it's same, I know, exactly. Well, we ha- so on that note, I think we have another question from our audience about, sure. um, and the question is, how can AI developers ensure the usability and user-centeredness of AI technologies in pediatric settings, particularly in the NICU where nurses play a critical role at the right. bedside? I think, I think is- like we were talking before, involving clinicians. Um, yeah. It, it has to be teamwork between the data scientists and the clinicians. Um, yeah. for it to be usable uh, down the road. And, you know, I, I'm thinking back to when I, um, uh, early in my um, clinical uh, practice uh, days, there was a new IV machine that was being deployed. Um, and um, the nurses kind of had their training and whatever, but then I had to learn it as well, because in an emergency, you never know, you have to still learn right. it, you know. And um, they had gone from like these big giant boxes on poles to these tiny, teeny tiny ones, which was great. And they were, yeah. um, you know, easier to use. But the, uh, for whatever reason, the, the override button to like stop the drip was on the back of the machine. Yeah. Instead of like the red, you know, there's a red button usually, <laughs> right? Like on a machine. And, and they're like, oh, you hold it here. And then you press with the back of your end. I'm like, what? <gasps> Why is that not the first thing I see, right? And so about usability and user centeredness, yeah. it's like I need to know where the red button is at all times, right. and I need to see it quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, along those lines, an uh, analogy that I once heard was, you know, when the elevator was first invented, people mm-hmm. didn't trust it, so they right? hired a little man to stand in the elevator and- <laughs> with the buttons as if they're going to be able to stop it from falling. That's right. And the same is true for AI in this, you know, transition phase where we don't trust it. We need um, sort of teamwork from experts who understand it to be there, be champions of it, to connect the the data science team with the clinical team and yeah. build trust. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So when we're thinking forward, so you've done SPO2, you've done heart rate, what's next? Like, what is the next thing that you're going to look at? Um, and yeah, to, um, not, not only NICU, like, what do you see right. next in terms of, you know, pediatrics? Right. In you know, I, we've, we've looked, and I think often when I, when I present our work, um, we get, oh, why don't you add the lab data and the demographics and all of that? But, um, you know, I think I think those have their their place in predictive models. But as far as an early warning system, if you add the lab values, you're only getting information on what the clinicians are doing. So a CBC was ordered because someone recognized a change and wanted to know the white count or the hematocrit mm-hmm. or the platelets. Um, the blood gas was ordered because they noticed a change in respiratory status, and it, um, all uh, any you know intervention support device uh, medication that's thrown into a model reflects clinician action and not the earliest signs of a change from the patient. Mm-hmm. And so we've really stuck with um, the the vital signs, the physiologic data and prediction models, adding demographics like gestational age, birth weight definitely improve the AUC, but then mm-hmm. those are static. So um, you don't see the change in risk um, right. with those, and you don't get that trigger to go to the bedside and look at the patient. Um, and you know, maybe a, a baseline score in combination with um, a continuous physiologic risk score um, would right. be useful to, to understand this patient's high risk at baseline, um, and now their physiology has changed. Um, uh, but a lot of that we do in our heads with knowing this is a 23 weeker at very high right. risk. <laughs> right, um, right. That that makes sense because it 20, you know, 20 weeks, 23 weeks, 
30 weeks, completely right. different kind yes. of. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Babies grow fast, right. <laughs> you know, in, in general. Right. <laughs> you know, in the right environment. Yeah, in our head, at the bedside, yeah. a, a model could probably do it more efficiently. And right. so, right. Um, you know, that that's sort of one avenue. And then, you know, there's there's more physiologic data um, that we collect and and um, our, our new directions are in sort of, you know, novel physiologic monitoring data. Um, we've, we're working on respiratory center, uh, sensors to, to look at breathing mm -hmm. fanatics. Um, the respiratory rate chest impedance data that um, we found much less useful because it's averaged over several breaths and babies have periodic breathing and short interbreath intervals and, mm -hmm. um, uh, the respiratory rate from what we've looked at has not been as useful, um, uh, but still still contains some information. Something, so, yeah, yeah, um, you know, really just focusing on physiologic data, but also uh, the rest of the data and how to how to incorporate it in those decision moments. That's that's pretty cool. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we have, a, you know, a fifth, sixth, seventh vital signs in right. certain contexts for us, right? right? Uh, that this will be, like a hero score will be part of the vital signs of a uh, premature infant, yeah, right? And so I, I can absolutely foresee that in, in the future. Um, so last question before we wrap up in terms of ethical considerations, you know, we've, t I think you touched upon a lot of things in terms of collecting data, demographics and, and whatnot. In terms of training these algorithms, one of the things that we're always mindful of is making sure that we are, when we're building an algorithm and we're applying it to a patient in front of us, that the right data has been input uh, from the beginning right. to train that so that we can make the right decision for the right patient at the right time. Right. Um, what are some of the ethical challenges that you're, you have foreseen or can foresee in the future in, in terms of building right. these algorithms? Um, I think there are ethical challenges both in developing the model to ensure you're not uh, introducing bias into what the model is detecting and predicting, but also in how it's implemented. So, um, you know, uh, models that use demographics, um, you know, some of those demographic baseline characteristics can can carry bias just in in um, in what they the information they hold. Um, we uh, and then also making sure that the data set the the patient population used to train the model is representative of the population intended to treat. Um, and that's where external validation and multi center trials are critical to um, ensure. You know, equal performance uh, across populations. Um, in the, the HERO trial, we did a secondary analysis um, because you know we had babies where the monitor was displayed and not displayed, um, diverse cohort across nine centers, um, diverse US cohort, uh, <laughs> I'll add, but uh, uh, we did find, you know, fortunately that the the heart rate characteristics um, were the same by race and sex. Um, and, um, you know, the HERO system, the trial was very pragmatic in that the, it was displayed um, without a mandated action. So users were taught if the score rises above two, that's a greater than twofold increased risk of sepsis, go look at the patient, consider a blood culture, um, put it in context with the rest of the information. And so with that sort of vague guideline, we worried, um, you know, was there implicit bias in who got blood cultures, who got treated, um, and that sort of thing. And um, so we looked at blood cultures, antibiotics, um, mortality, sepsis, length of stay, and found no differences across the board, which was um, reassuring, except in um, the the rate of blood culture. So white infants randomized to having the hero score displayed had um, a slightly higher risk of uh, having one or more blood culture than the non-display group. 
And the same was not true for black infants. The, the rate of blood cultures mm -hmm. was the same. Um, that didn't translate into more antibiotics, um, but um, uh, it's either group. something that sort of, you know, it is worth evaluating um, prospectively and ensuring that we're not responding differently um, based on the, the family or the, um, right. the race of the patient. Um, and I think it, the same is true for for any AI model um, where the um, the action is not mandated and and sort of the the uses the the, uses, the decision yeah. is up to the user. That's right. That's again that partnership between technology and human is is the important aspect of it. Right. Well, um, I want to thank you, Dr. Bryn Sullivan, for joining us today. This was a very informative and interesting conversation. I certainly learned a lot about the NICU. Um, again, I haven't been in a NICU since I was in uh, in school. Uh, so I applaud the work you and your team are doing. And we thank hope you. to kind of have you here again when you have another uh, more data to present. So thank you of so course. much for taking time out of your busy day, and we hope um, you'll join us at a future event. Of course. Thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. Hitvi, we'll take it from there. And as we wrap up today's insightful discussion, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed speakers for enlightening us with their expertise and innovative perspectives in the realm of AI and NICQ. And thank you to our engaged audience for their active participation. Until next time, take care and stay healthy. Goodbye. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bryn. Have a great day. I really Thank appreciate you so the much. time. Yeah, I hope uh, it went okay and you think you got what you needed. And... Yeah. Oh. Um, it'd be, we can stop recording. Yes. The recording has stopped. <laughs> great. We did. This was great, Brent. It was really, really helpful. Honestly, Thank you. it was great. Thank you. Okay. Um, and yeah, and you're welcome back anytime. And if you have any colleagues who are interested, by all means. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> We uh, we try to do about two. One you would be an etologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, because here's the thing: that is, this is a very small and emerging field, and there's not a lot of people doing this kind of work, and so it's important to kind of highlight where is this work being done, and what are the challenges around it, so that we can right. have more people join. You know. Well, thank All right. you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Hitvi, I'm going to sign off. Thank you. We'll be in touch with an email with the link of the YouTube. Okay. Video.